Well, good morning and welcome to St. Peter's Chertsey and to our morning service. It's great to have you with us. I'd like to welcome our own congregations, but also a lot of people too who are tuning in from elsewhere. Welcome to you all wherever you are. This service is going to be shared by a number of us. Uh, Matt is going to be leading a good chunk of this service. I will be uh, preaching later on. We have the Mead family who are going to be leading our prayers today. Pauline is going to be uh, bringing our reading to us. And I've been very grateful this week to all the work that our musicians have been doing, uh, particularly uh, to Heather, who has been doing some recordings on the keyboard. Also to Jim also, who has been doing a range of recordings for us to use today and in the weeks that lie ahead. So a lot of people have been working very hard this week and I'm very, very grateful to them. We're going to begin now with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day, for this opportunity to come before you. As we gather together this morning, we bring before you those issues that are on our minds, that are on our hearts, those unresolved situations that we face and that remain with us. We hand them to you and pray that as we worship you today, you would speak afresh into our lives and into those situations. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And so we move now into our opening worship. Oh, 
And so we come now to a time of confession. Lord Jesus Christ, risen Master and triumphant Lord, we come to you in sorrow for our sins and confess to you our weakness and unbelief. We have lived by our own strength and not by the power of your resurrection. In your mercy, forgive us. Lord, hear us and help us. We have lived by the light of our own eyes, as faithless and not believing. In your mercy, forgive us. Lord, hear us and help us. We have lived for this world alone and doubted our home in heaven. In your mercy, forgive us. Lord, hear us and help us. And so may God the Father forgive us by the death of his Son and strengthen us to live in the power of the Spirit all our days. Amen. We're going to have uh, some more time of some worship.
The reading this morning is from John's Gospel, chapter 20, verses 24 to 30. Jesus appears to Thomas. Now Thomas, also known as Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the nail marks in his hands, and put my fingers where the nails were, and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here, see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. This is the word of the Lord. Well, I wonder whether you are a glass half full or a glass half empty person whether you are an optimist or a pessimist. Someone said to me quite recently, I've always been a pessimist. I've always been a half empty person. You see, if the worst happens, I'm not surprised. But if the best happens, then it's a bonus. I am generally an optimist, but I'm very attracted by a character in the New Testament who was clearly a pessimist, and that character is Thomas. We read of Thomas a few minutes ago. Thomas was very clearly a pessimist, a glass empty person. We find that particularly as we read through John's Gospel. Dear Thomas, he knew and loved Jesus dearly. He was one of the disciples and he was heartbroken when he stood at the cross and saw Jesus die in front of his eyes. But Thomas wasn't around on that first resurrection day when Jesus rose from the dead and appeared to the other disciples. He missed out and he simply couldn't bring himself to believe what the other disciples were telling him. We take up the story from the gospel. We've seen the Lord, they told him, with their hearts overjoyed and bursting with the news. 
And Thomas' response was this, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my fingers where the nails are and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. There is an honesty about Thomas. There's an honesty about his response. Thomas longed to believe, and yet it was just too good to be true. Thomas wasn't being awkward. He wasn't being dismissive. He wasn't in the business of seeking to debunk the news about Jesus. But after all, dead people don't rise from the dead. Thomas's point was clearly this, I simply can't believe unless I see the risen Jesus for myself. Before going any further, I want to give some context to this passage and also to the whole of John's Gospel. A great deal of what I'm saying in these next two or three minutes I have preached on before, but it's actually critical that we grasp something of the nature of John's Gospel if we're to fully understand what this passage is all about. John's Gospel was written much later than the other three Gospels, Matthew, Mark and Luke. John knew Jesus personally and was almost certainly the one described as Jesus, as the closest disciple. John lived a very long life. We know that beyond any doubt. He almost certainly lived into his 90s. That would have been unusual in the first century. It's uh, pretty clear that towards the end of his life, he lived in the city of Ephesus. And it's quite likely that he lived with and looked after Mary, the mother of Jesus, until her death. John's Gospel is very different than the other three synoptic Gospels. John has had chance to reflect long and hard on this Jesus that he knew so well. And who over the years he'd mulled over, who is this Jesus? What actually does he mean to us today? He'd mulled over the nature of the resurrection. And so we have in his gospel something deeply, deeply reflective, as well as being historic. And so as a very old man, John writes his record of Jesus, the good news of Jesus's life. He's using his memories and the memories of those known to him too. And he writes a very carefully crafted gospel telling us facts and memories, but very, very keen to bring out the significance of uh, what he's speaking of. John doesn't begin like the other gospel writers in Bethlehem with the Christmas story, the Christmas narrative. We see no shepherds or angels or stars. Of course, John would have known about all of this. And yet for John, He was wanting to make a really, really important point on reflecting on this Jesus and who he was and is. He begins his gospel by doing something profound. What he does is what today we would call a cut and paste job. You know, when on the computer you click on a particular piece of text and then you lift it and place it somewhere else. John is effectively doing that at the beginning of his gospel and he clicks actually on the first few words of Genesis and he places them at the beginning of his gospel and he begins with these words in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God he was with God in the beginning through him All things were made. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the father, full of grace and truth. What John is making clear at the beginning of his gospel 
is that when we look at Jesus, we look at his life, we look at his death and his resurrection, we are looking at no less than God himself. He was there in the beginning, at the beginning of that creative process. What John is saying is in Jesus, we have God with flesh on. Now let's do a fast forward 20 chapters to the very end of John's Gospel. Actually to the bit that originally was the ending. Most scholars agree that the original Gospel finished with the record of Thomas and his uh, and Jesus' appearance to him. Jesus did many other signs which were not written in this book but these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ the Son of God. After the Thomas story we have that kind of official ending. So let's look at this ending which begins in verse 24. Thomas can't bring himself to believe that Jesus has appeared and in this statement we read this. We come back to uh, to verse 24. A week later his disciples were in the house again and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked Jesus came and stood among them and said peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas put your fingers here See my hands, reach out your hand and put it in my side. Stop doubting and believe. What was Thomas's response? My Lord and my God. You know, Thomas was the first person in, the, in any of the Gospels to look at Jesus and to dress him as no less than God himself, my Lord and my God. That's how John finishes his gospel, with that declaration of Thomas, the one who couldn't believe, having met with the risen Christ, and simply saying this, my Lord and my God. It was wholehearted. Remember at the beginning of that gospel he had begun with that whole issue, that whole a record of the word being made flesh and coming to dwell among us. The gospel culminates in these wonderful words of Thomas, my Lord and my God. John's gospel has come full circle. But let's look at Thomas's response. He didn't respond to the risen Christ when he finally met him with these kind of words. Oh, so it's true after all. It is true what you said last week. That wasn't his response at all. It was a total commitment to Jesus with the words, my Lord and my God. I think this has to be one of the most profound moments in the whole of the New Testament. Dear Thomas, that dour, glass half empty person who earlier on in John's gospel is seen as the one who, when he knows that Jesus is going to Jerusalem to die, says, well, I might as well go and, and be with you and die with you. He was the one when Jesus said, I am the way. Thomas said, well, we don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? We have this dour, dour John. But then we have what happens after the resurrection. That dourness comes through when on the first occasion that Jesus appears, he's not around. He can't believe. You know, Jesus knew Thomas so well. He knew his personality. I guess he knew something of his depressive nature. 
the introversion of Thomas. He knew that Thomas needed evidence for the resurrection. Jesus, in his love and his grace, knew all about him. And he knows all about us, all of our funny ways too. Jesus knew what sort of man Thomas is and he knows what kind of people we are. For Thomas, he offered that invitation to reach out and touch the marks in his hands of crucifixion and to touch his side. We don't know whether he took that opportunity or not. John doesn't make that clear. You know, Jesus knows us, he knows you and me. He knows all our funny ways, all those personality traits that frustrate us and probably frustrate others too. He knows our doubts, he knows our uncertainties. Thomas clearly has so many of them. And as with Thomas, Jesus will meet us where we are and reveal himself to us if we seriously seek him. We can be sure of that. Seek and you will find, knock and the door will be open. We hear those words of Jesus earlier. The important thing is to be genuinely open and longing to meet with and encounter the risen Christ. Maybe this passage speaks to you in your faith journey, or maybe you might describe it as your lack of faith journey. God doesn't turn away from us if we doubt, but genuinely long to seek the truth. I think that's one of the most profound messages of this particular event. So where do you stand on your faith journey? Because most of us are on a journey and at different stages. The important question is to ask ourselves whether we long to believe and to become even more assured in that belief and in that faith. It isn't about other people or what they believe or don't believe. What about you? Jesus knows you as he knew Thomas. He doesn't reject doubters. He longs to bring them to faith and an assurance in those who seriously seek him. There's a great opportunity to discover more about this Jesus, about who he was, who he is, to look at some of those big issues of faith. And we do that regularly through our Alpha course. We have one beginning soon. We haven't yet got a start date, but a number of people are already showing interest in joining an online Alpha course. It will probably begin within the next fortnight. And we're going to look at some of those big issues of faith and of doubt. It's so important to be honest about our questioning. And this would be a great opportunity. And I would encourage you to consider that if you've not already done that course. I was reflecting on one of the greatest pessimist that I remember doing the Alpha course some years ago now. He was dragged along by his then girlfriend and now wife. Actually, he's now a vicar. Now, I want to say to you that most people that complete the Alpha course don't become vicars, but actually it does show what God can do with pessimists and with doubters. Let's be still. Thank you, Lord, that you met Thomas just where he was. You acknowledged his doubt. You took into consideration his, personal, his personality. All those 
aspects of him that were saying, no, 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 I can't believe. And yet his longing to believe. We pray that will be true for each of us as we seek the truth about you. In Jesus' name, amen. And so we're going to continue now as we move into a time of worship.
Good morning. Please join us now as we pray together to our Heavenly Father. God of love, have mercy on your people. We lift our world to you now and pray that you will help all peoples facing such frightening and uncertain times under the shadow of COVID-19. Father God, we approach you now as a broken nation and a world that is plagued with sickness, pain and sadness. God of love, have mercy on your people. Every person is a precious part of your creation and we know that you love each of us with your everlasting, perfect love. So how it must pain you as a creator God to see so many people suffering with the effects of the virus. But whilst we face this pandemic as a predominantly united nation with a cohesive National Health Service, we pray especially for those facing this in the midst of conflict, poverty, pain and hunger. For some, this latest tragedy is yet another layer of suffering that they must endure. God of love, have mercy on your people. We pray for leaders and governments across the world that each individual involved with decision making may seek to put others' needs before their own, that they will speak words of truth, that they might fight for justice for all and in doing so, reflect an integrity that is worthy of their office. We thank you for our leaders, for Her Majesty the Queen, for our Prime Minister, Health Secretary, our MPs and Chief Scientists and Advisory Experts. May they be given wisdom and strength to lead us in the ongoing uncertainty of the current lockdown and beyond. Keep them physically and mentally strong as they deal with the severity of this pandemic whilst they are in office. God of love, have mercy on your people. Father God, we bring before you our town of Chertsey. We thank you for the people who keep us safe, the police, the fire brigade and the paramedics. Give them rest and protect them in their work. We thank you for the people who do the essential job of keeping things clean to reduce the risk of the virus spreading. Hospital cleaners, street cleaners, and those who collect our rubbish. We thank you for those who look out for the vulnerable and isolated. For women's refuges, the Runnymede Food Bank, Chertsey Good Neighbours, alcohol and drug support teams, local mental health nurses, and the staff at social services. Keep them well, enable them to be vigilant and responsive within the challenges of social distancing and isolation. We thank you for the people who th deliver the things we need, post office workers, delivery drivers, local bus and train drivers. We thank you for those people working to keep our town supplied with energy, water and the internet, so that we, we are warm, have power and can stay in touch. We thank you for those people who work to ensure we have food to eat, the farmers, crop pickers, warehouse workers and staff in our local supermarkets. Give us grateful hearts and patience as we queue. May we never take for granted the blessings of choice. We pray for our church here at St Peter's. We thank you for the many friends and visitors who are joining with us in our online church and are hearing more of Jesus' love. Thank you for our vicar Tim, his leadership, commitment, inspiration, and the comfort he is bringing to many through his Hope in a Time of Crisis reflections. We pray for the whole team, for Tim, Matt, Christine, Gerard and Ellie as they face new challenges. And we thank you for the technology and for those that enable us to use it to stay connected. We pray for those involved in supporting the bereaved locally. Priests, ministers, counsellors, funeral directors and crematorium staff. Give them wisdom and compassion as they provide services with restrictions and delays which can be distressing for families. We pray for those known to us and those known only to you, Lord, who are struggling with illness, isolation and bereavement. Please bring before God now those people especially on your heart.
May we, as a Christian community, help to be a source of comfort and support both now and after the end of lockdown. Finally, Lord, we pray for the people who care for and comfort us. We remember all the staff at Ashford and St Peter's hospitals, local nursing care and residential homes, our GP practices, community health care workers and our local hospice. Lord, protect these individuals as they work to bring healing, comfort and rehabilitation. Enable them to work safely to reduce the risk of virus transmission. Give them compassion and strength as they care for patients who feel lonely, anxious and frightened as they are separated from loved ones. And please give the staff rest and peaceful sleep on days off. We pray for a real sense of your presence and the hope you bring into darkness. Thank you for the chaplaincy team at St Peter's who are bringing comfort to both staff and patients at this challenging time. We bring these prayers to you, knowing you hear us, that you care for us, and that you will answer us. Amen. Amen. Dear God, thank you for this beautiful sunshine we have been having, and that even though we are inside, we can still enjoy it. Please. Please pray for the people who live in flats and that don't have a garden to go into. Please keep everybody safe, especially the people who can't leave their houses. Thank you for all the teachers who still help us learn even though we can't see them. Please pray for everybody missing school and for everyone missing important exams. Help them still learn. Amen. A prayer by teenager. Dear God, comfort those who are separated from family members. Please help those kids who cannot put up with, the, with being at home with their parents all the time. Please protect those who don't feel safe at home. Amen. 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 So do please now join us in the prayer that our Saviour, Jesus Christ himself, taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed, hallowed be your name. name. Your, your kingdom, kingdom come. come. Your, your will, will be done, done on earth, earth as, as in heaven. heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Well, thank you so much for joining us for today's worship service online. It's been great to worship together in this way. Can I say a final blessing over us before we go? May the God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, make you perfect in every good work to do his will. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be with you and remain with you always. Amen. was crowned with thorns is crowned with glory now the Saviour knelt to wash our feet now at his feet we bow Thank you.
God is alive.